Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us today. We'll be getting started in just a few moments. Thank you all for joining us. We'll get started in just a few moments once Zoom has had a chance to admit everyone into our webinar today. All right. Welcome again. My name is Erin Lurie, and I'm the head of adult audiences at Hillwood Estate Museum and Gardens. My pronouns are she, her. We're so glad to gather with our friends near and far, especially for those of you in the DC area on this dreary, rainy day, to step inside Hillwood's beautiful greenhouse. We do have some amazing programs coming up, and Drew, if you can share the next slide. I hope that you'll all join us as we continue to escape virtually as well as planning your next visit to Hillwood in person. In a few moments, I'll drop a link into the chat for our ORCID 101 class, which Drew will be leading this Friday as a nice companion to today's tour. Before we continue with the program today, I'd just like to share a few practical reminders about Zoom. Your cameras and microphones are not active, but we do still want to hear from you, so please say hello in the chat. You can use the Q&A feature, which will appear at either the top or the bottom of your screen, to submit questions, and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can at the end of the program. Please note that that Q&A is separate from the chat. It's now my pleasure to introduce Drew Asbury, Hillwood's horticulturalist and volunteer manager. Drew joined Hillwood in 2012 and is responsible for the greenhouses, cutting garden, and the horticulture volunteer program. He's worked professionally in the horticulture industry for nearly 20 years in a variety of positions, including garden center sales, greenhouse growing, landscape management, and design. Drew graduated from the Longwood Gardens Professional Gardener Training Program in 2006 and completed a master's degree in sustainable gardening from George Washington University in 2020. He is also responsible for the wonderful greenhouses that he'll be sharing with us today. Drew, thanks so much for being here. Hey, thank you, Aaron, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. And again, welcome to our virtual uh, greenhouse tour. Uh, again, my name is Drew Asbury, and I'm honored to be here today to speak to you about our tradition of growing orchids here at Hillwood. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with us, we are uh, located in Washington, D.C., and we are the former home of Marjorie Merriweather Post, who lived here at Hillwood during the 1950s and 1960s, um, all the while planning for Hillwood um, to become her lasting legacy and one to be shared and open to the public upon her death. And so Marjorie Post was a mother, a businesswoman, a philanthropist. Uh, she was certainly known as a legendary entertainer in the DC circuit and most closely related to our talk today, um, she was a collector of many, many fine things. And so visitors today inside the mansion um, will enjoy her collections of 18th century French decorative arts as well as Russian imperial art. Uh, but at the same time, uh, they also get to wander through a kitchen and a butler's pantry and a formal dining room um, straight out of the 1950s era. So there's a little bit for everyone to see um, here at Hillwood. Uh, but before, um, of course, we're here today, though, to talk about her love affair uh, with orchids, um, which she amassed a collection of nearly 2,000 plants. Um, while she lived here at Hillwood. And here we can see uh, Marjorie Post on her honeymoon cruise with husband Herbert May, um, wearing here a rather large um, corsage made up of her favorite type of orchid, um, the Cattleya or the corsage orchid. Um, as for our outdoor areas, we're a 25 acre property, um, half of which is laid out as a series of garden rooms. Basically everything we see on the right side of the photo were the formal gardens. Um, but today we're going to explore the greenhouse over here, which Marjorie Post uh, greatly expanded um, during her time here to house that massive collection of orchids. 
And while this was over on the service side of the property, and maybe not necessarily part of the formal gardens or that formal tour experience, it, it surely wasn't off limits to her guest. But the biggest purpose of the, gar of the greenhouse is was to grow orchids and plants such as these cymbidiums on the left. And then when they were in bloom, they would be moved over to the mansion and put into these large displays um, inside the house uh, for her and her visitors to enjoy um, inside, the, inside the home. And so here we can see a couple of displays which were put together um, inside the mansion's entry hall. Um, these displays would have been some of the very first things that her visitors um, would have uh, seen as they entered through the front doors of the house. Um, I love how, you know, how intricate and detailed and how it appears that like either, every leaf of ivy here um, seems to be in just the perfect position. But here we can see some examples of Catleas. This is, again was her favorite orchid of all. We also see some nobile uh, dendrobiums. Um, we see some phalaenopsis, as well as um, either some cymbidiums or some oncidiums here um, in the background. But it was truly in her breakfast room, which was just a little nook off the formal dining room, um, where these uh, and orchid displays were really the most extravagant. Um, and here in the picture on the left, uh, we can see some massive um, Cattleya specimens here in the bay windows. Um, and the fragrance must have just been absolutely intoxicating, if not overwhelming, um, for some guests in this room, because really all it takes is two or three flowers of a Cattleya to really perfume a small room. Um, and here we're looking at 100 um, open flowers. So I think it truly shows how much she must have loved uh, the fragrance and just these plants in general. And then on the right, we'll see, um, you know, an example of how these displays were regularly rotated and often reflected the season. Um, so besides orchids, we can also see in the background some hydrangeas and some lilies, which most likely would have also have been grown in the greenhouse, at, you know, and then brought over here um, to the mansion while they were in bloom. We can also see an extravagant example of using cattleyas as just simply cut flowers um, in this lovely little arrangement on the, the center of the table. And so this is one of the very many traditions we carry on today. So this is a photo from about a month ago. In the center is a display of Phalaenopsis orchids and flanked off by the sides there with some seasonal amaryllis. Um, and we also have started some of our own traditions in that photo on the right. We now keep um, up in uh, Marjorie Post's uh, bedroom. Um, on her mantle place, uh, the fireplace, um, we keep a little bud vase with a fresh cut orchid. And if you look close enough at her portrait there, um, yes, we see she is holding on to an orchid flower. And so our greenhouses today, some 50 years later, um, appear very much like they did during the days of Marjorie Post. Um, and it's hard to believe that in a month from now, this is what we will be looking like. It'll be daffodil and tulip season around here um, before we know it. So uh, we still continue to keep, keep a collection of about 2000 orchids um, in the greenhouse. Um, but yet one of the biggest differences um, today is that our greenhouses um, now uh, receive about 75 to 80,000 visitors a year. So while we still keep a few orchids and displays inside the mansion, the vast majority of our, of our plants and our displays are now kept in the greenhouse year round. So when visitors first enter into the greenhouse, they'll actually start to notice that it's actually divided up into five smaller greenhouses, um, which is ideal for us as orchid growers because now we can adjust uh, the heat and the light and the temperature in each of these five zones, which allows us to grow a wider range of orchids. Um, so here in our entry houses, we, we consider this to be a warm growing house. Um, we can see on the center bench here display, these are all different types of Cattleyas. Again, the Corsage orchid, these were, you know, again, Marjorie Post's favorite orchids. Um, but we also see the most popular of orchids today. I'm sure this is uh, recognizable by many of our viewers today. Uh, these are the Phalaenopsis orchids or the Malt orchid, uh, the one we see at every checkout um, or the florist station in every grocery store. Okay, Both of these are considered warm loving orchids, so they, they grow pretty well in this somewhat of the same temperature uh, regime. And by warm, we're implying that the house, the temperature in these houses 
never really drop below the low 60s at night um, during the winter time. Um, something else that makes uh, Hillwood's uh, orchid greenhouses a little unique in the world of uh, the public gardens is that all of our uh, greenhouses are considered to be working greenhouses, which implies that all 2,000 orchids are on view every day. So it's a great opportunity if you are an orchid enthusiast, you can come out and see a large amount of orchids. Um, not all of them will be in bloom ever, but um, a little different than just having a blooming showcase um, as many public gardens do. Um, and also, which I think is evident in these photos, we are plant lovers. So we uh, fill these greenhouses um, also with a lot of tropical foliage plants, uh, many of which will summer outside in our exterior displays or in different interior scape displays around the campus, um, but often find their way back to the greenhouse at one point or another. Um, here are some more of those Phalaenopsis orchids, again, that moth orchid. Um, these are super, super popular, and they're always recommended by virtually every resource as the best one for beginners to grow. Um, and I, I totally agree uh, with that recommendation. Um, uh, they're not only the easiest to grow, but they're also tend to be the easiest to get to rebloom, which of course is the biggest goal of, of orchid uh, growing. Um, something that stands out to me that makes Phalaenopsis a little bit more unique is that they have an extremely long bloom season, um, particularly once you've had that plant for a while and it's happy and healthy in your environment. But what is slightly unique about Phalaenopsis is that as these older first flowers begin to fall off, you can still get flower buds developing. So this is why they can bloom and bloom and bloom and bloom, um, yet easily for up to six months um, once happy. Um, I'd love to give a shout out to our orchid staff and volunteers at Hillwood. It's a whole team of gardeners here. Um, here we see our orchid and tropical plant specialist, Andrew, working alongside um, an orchid volunteer. This was the photo on the left was about three or four years ago where Andrew was working with Phalaenopsis, that moth orchid, creating this, this topiary ball. Um, and here on the right, we can see that same plant about three or four years. This was taken earlier this, this winter um, when it was just starting to come into bloom. And below, we can see that Phalaenopsis collection of all those blooming spikes coming, but only a couple blooms open um, as we're adjusting it and, and adjusting the display. And then the Cattleya orchid, right? Another warm, loving orchid. Uh, and there, this is uh, something that's unique about the Cattleyas. Uh, we often call it the Cattleya Alliance because there are so many different species and closely related genera to Cattleyas that we loosely group them together. Um, all these uh, species and plants can interbreed, um, which is where orchid enthusiasts and breeders have come about to make thousands and thousands of hybrids over the years. And so it's easy to see with the diversity of colors and forms, why this group may possibly have been, you know, Marjorie Post's favorite orchid, as well as many other orchid uh, growers. Um, so while these don't necessarily bloom as long as Phalaenopsis, I think most people would be happy with two, three, four weeks tops of these plants being in bloom. What is uh, makes them so unique is again this really large flower size, a really powerful fragrance, and all of this diversity of color and form. Um, certainly a knockout of an orchid to experiment with. And then we have our Vanda as our last warm loving orchid that we'll look at today on our tour. Um, what makes them unique is these require more sunlight than any orchid in our entire collection. They can handle nearly full sun um, uh, during the winter time in particular, just a bit of filtered sun um, during the summertime. And here you can see them hanging in the greenhouse on the right. These plants have no soil media. There's basically uh, air around their roots the entire time. Their roots are dangling in the air, uh, but yet we do have a very nice fogging system in the summer and even in the winter time, these plants will get a daily little shower with the hose um, to, to let those roots absorb a little bit of, of moisture. And then if we're moving on to our cool greenhouse, uh, which houses our cymbidium collection, that's a detail of a cymbidium flower there on the left and the bigger plants on the right. Um, temperatures in this house reach down to the, into the upper 40s and low 50s during the winter time um, at night. 
Um, cool loving orchids in general are a bit trickier to grow here in the mid-Atlantic and it's not necessarily giving them cool conditions during the winter, it's, it's keeping them cool in the summertime that's a bit of a challenge as they really dislike our, our heat and humidity in the Washington DC summertime. Um, also in this photo, it's a bit misleading. You can see clear glass up here on the right. This photo was taken in February. There's only a couple months out of the year, December, January, and February, where we have clear glass to let as much sunlight in as we can. The other nine months of the year, we actually apply a white um, latex paint on the outside of the glass, which provides a much more filtered sunlight. This would be way too intense of sunlight um, during the summer months for most orchids. Uh, but these cymbidiums, uh, besides enjoying temperatures in the winter in the 40s and 50s, um, these plants also naturally grow in an environment of the world where there's a dry season and a wet season. So if these orchids did not receive both cool nights and a dry period, you know, they might grow and have beautiful foliage, but they would never flower. Okay, so these plants are one of the very few that we actually take out of the greenhouse during the summer. We put them on our back porch, which is a much cooler environment. It's shadier and cooler. Um, and then we will leave these plants outside until it's downright chilly and we start seeing frost advisories for the area. Uh, that's when we'll bring them back into the greenhouse. We turn the thermostat down. We really start restricting their water. So now we're getting them cool and dry, right? So again, the idea of what we're trying to do is we're trying to attempt to recreate that native habitat, cold and dry in the winter, cool and moist during the summertime, right? These are the things we start thinking about when we're trying to grow um, different orchid um, uh, genera. So another really big group of orchids are the dendrobiums. Uh, these are the nobile type of dendrobiums. This is almost identical care to the cymbidiums. We summer them outside. We leave them outside till it's really chilly. We bring them in and the exception to these orchids is that these will not receive a drop of water for about, th about three months or so. So during the dead of winter, very cold, very, very dry, Often they'll shed a lot of their leaves, um, but that temperature and dryness are the environmental cues that encourage these plants to come into bloom. And then shortly after they bloom, we start seeing new growth on them, and then we start hitting them with water and increasing the temperatures. So the dendrobiums are actually an extremely diverse group of different orchids. There's about 1,500 different species amongst the dendrobium alliance. Um, not all are cool loving, some are warm loving, and there's everything in between. Some are huge, some are small. I particularly am a fan of this guy off here on the left. These are, these are the Kingianum, often referred to as Australian dendrobiums. I like that they're, they're a bit of a miniature. So a little pot that's only a four or five inch pot might have a dozen or two um, stems or culms or pseudobulbs, which the more little pseudobulbs and growths you have, well, the more potential you have for all these dainty little bloom spikes here um, at the top. Um, so our last orchid greenhouse is our intermediate greenhouse. This is where those orchids that are neither considered warm loving or cool loving. Um, this is what houses our Paphiopedilum collection or our slipper collection, which is on the left. On the right is, our, is an Alcidium. Um, so temperatures in the intermediate house tend to not fall below the upper 50s at night to about 60 degrees. Um, but in reality, you know, all of these variations in temperature that I'm, I'm referring to today um, is quite subtle. But our goal at Hillwood is the same goal as orchid growers at home. And that's, again, we're trying to recreate that plant's natural habitat, right? So just providing the correct amount of light and temperature and moisture. So in the picture on the left of our lady slippers, you can see how this bench is, is actually all in shade. This is a north facing bench, but you can imagine on the other side, you can see that intense sunlight coming in on the south side, right? So these are just one of the ways that we'll start, you know, tweaking the environment. Because of course the ultimate goal in growing orchids is getting them to bloom. But of course, in order to get them to bloom, we need to grow a happy, healthy plant, which involves knowing, you know, trying to recreate their natural environment. And so the proper environmental conditions, which do change over the course of a year, right, 
it's often these changes in the environment, um, whether that be temperature, light, moisture, the couple things we've discussed, you know, it's those changes that often encourage a plant to bloom. And so here we'll see a, the wide diversity of the lady slippers coming in all different sizes, colors, shapes, and forms. Um, lady slippers are often also considered to be a great beginner orchid. If you've mastered the Phalaenopsis at home, I would give a lady slipper a try. They often can grow side by side with the same um, cultural conditions. We also have uh, the Oncidium collection in this intermediate house, it, another massive group of closely related um, plants that we consider we group loosely into this Oncidium alliance. Um, here, I'm particularly a fan of the spider orchids, it's a common name for brassias, with these really long, elongated um, petals. Um, a crowd favorite, if we, we always introduce this plant when we're giving tours like this in person and we ask everyone to smell it, um, this plant is the common name for this plant is the chocolate orchid. Uh, it does not produce chocolate, that's a different plant, but, uh, but it has a very strong fragrance um, of a chocolate-like um, fragrance. And then, you know, lastly today, we really looked at some of the really big groups of different orchids um, in our collection, but there are just so many more out there um, and one-offs and oddballs. Um, to name a few here, the one on the left, that's Ludigia discolor, often called the jewel orchid. These are often sold in, in, house plant, in the house plant section of the garden center, and they're not even labeled as an orchid. So, Jewel orchids are kind of fun. Like that would be a good one for beginners to try as well. Um, the uh, dendrochylum here are the chain orchids, aptly named because of these long pendulous bloom stalks that can reach down 18 to 24 inches long. The stanhopias are one of my favorites. That's this guy here, um, third picture over. Massive plants. Those are huge leaves. We have them growing in moss baskets because their bloom stalks actually go downwards. So if this was planted in a traditional pot, that bloom stalk would go down, hit the bottom of a pot, spiral around, and we would never see the blooms. But here in the background, you can actually see some of the buds, the flowering stalks coming out. Here, this guy, he's kind of coming out of the side of the, this mesh pot here extremely fragrant flowers. So if you're looking for a challenging, um, not so much of a challenge, everything's easy in the greenhouse folks, but this would be a little bit more challenging, um, not in a greenhouse because of its size um, and this downward facing bloom stalk. And then last but not least, the last one we'll talk about today, this guy off to the right is the vanilla vine. So that same vanilla that you have in your pantry at home, if it's the authentic thing, it comes from an orchid. Um, this vine, gangly vine, will eventually produce little flowers. Once pollinated, those flowers turn into the vanilla bean and the rest is history. So uh, there's so much diversity in the world of orchids. You know, I highly encourage um, everyone that's in the, the area to please come out to Hillwood um, and wander through uh, the greenhouse yourself. So um, with that, um, that concludes our tour today. Um, thank you so much for joining us. As Aaron mentioned, I'd just love to give a shout out too about our upcoming programs. On Friday is Orchid 101, where we will go in detail all of those cultural conditions of light, water, temperature. We'll talk about humidity, airflow, fertilizer, repotting, basically all the basics of how to grow a plant healthy and of course how to get it to rebloom. And then on the 25th of the month, we will do a live in-person, well not live virtual, uh, repotting demo where we'll, we'll actually do some uh, repotting of plants right there um, uh, on screen. So with that, Erin, I turn it over to you. We have plenty of time for questions and answers. Excellent, and we do have a number of great questions. Please feel free to continue submitting those through that Q&A module located at the bottom or top of your screen. You hinted that this is part of what we'll be talking about with Orchid 101, Drew, but Anne asked what the best orchid you recommend is for someone who doesn't have a greenhouse, something that will be able to thrive and keep blooming indoors. 
Yeah, Aaron, without a doubt, it's that phalaenopsis orchid or the malt orchid. I mean, that's the one that you do see at every big box store, but every nursery will have them too, garden centers and such. But it's one that aligns itself very well with growing in, in our interiors, at our, in our homes. And if you have luck with traditional house plants, you know, there are some little tricks that make it a little different than your typical peace lily, but it's often the one that people have really good success with. And it's certainly a, a, a booster of your confidence of getting an easy to grow orchid first. So yeah, pull the trigger. Uh, the next time you're at the store, don't buy one on a day when it's 12 degrees outside or you're going to be driving around for five hours, you know, buy that plant, protect it, get it home quick, you know, put it in its spot, you know, yeah, go for it. Both Stephanie and um, Melissa asked, you mentioned that lady slippers are a good next step for those who are well-versed with their phalaenopsis. Where is the right place to start looking for those? You know, that's a really good question. And, you know, we used to, in the Washington DC area, there used to be a big uh, Kensington orchids. There was several large establishments. Um, nowadays, it's, there's, uh, it would be local garden centers. There are a few, uh, I'm a Maryland person. I know in Virginia, there's a couple orchid growers, it would be a Google search um, other than going to our local garden centers, which get in a, you know, regular shipments, right? They might not actually be growing orchids. Um, what we do here, we actually have gone um, to Lancaster and I'm forgetting the name for a moment, but Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Oh, I wish I could remember that name of that place, but that's a, that's a hefty drive from Washington. Um, so yeah, I wish I could give them the perfect reason. And you know, orchids ship too. We actually have received orchids through the mail as well. Um, they come bundled up and you know, you have to cross your fingers a little bit when you're shipping plants in flower bud across the country, but um, it, it is a way to expand a collection in a reasonable economical way. We also have a couple of questions about how you care for the greenhouses. Um, specifically, a little bit more information about the latex paint and the glass panels. Yeah, yeah. Um, those glass panels, I don't know much about those. They've been there since I've been here for 10 years, right? So um, the infrastructure itself, luckily Hillwood has a lovely facilities department because it is, it, it might look old fashioned, but it's all run by computers. So between um, the mechanical running and the computer systems, it is a bit of a technical challenge. Um, but latex paint is simple. There's actually a paint that is recommended, again, if you Google, greenhouse shade paint. The name of the actual one that I am thinking of, I cannot think of the actual brand name, but there are several out there. There comes in green tint or white tint. This is something that's been done in the greenhouse industry for eons. Um, and even days of Marjorie Post, you could see a whitewashing on the window. So we apply that with a, a typical big backpack tank sprayer. So we'll, we dilute the paint into, it's, I think it's like a 10% paint to 90% water. We get out the big ladder. We're literally just spraying it onto the greenhouse structure. It often has to be reapplied a couple of times over the course of the season. And then um, we stop doing that late summer as the sun starts getting less and less intense. Um, it starts to naturally wash off anyway as fall is coming. And then some point in about December, we say, okay, that's enough. We need to get up. We take out the long brushes with a 20 foot pole and we literally brush that paint off and with water, it runs right off. So uh, yeah, a lot of people nowadays will use uh, shade cloth is kind of the, the equivalent, um, but that doesn't work on glass greenhouses. It is quite a sight to watch how quickly y'all can transform the greenhouse with the painting and with the scrub brushing. Um, it is fun to see it change over the course of a day. Yes. Rick asked if we know much about the orchids that are from MMP's collection or Marjorie Merriweather Post, the Hillwood Flower. Particularly, Rick asked about how possible it is for orchids to live that long and longer. 
great. That's a great question. We get asked that all the time, and it's kind of a two part question. So remind me the second part when I forget. But uh, the first part, Marjorie Post collection, we are unaware of any of these plants are lingering from her time. For a very brief amount of time, our Hillwood collection actually moved over to the Smithsonian in the mid 1970s, um, which the Smithsonian now touts as what began their collection. They just put a big post on Facebook page about it, um, uh, dropping Marjorie Post's name, um, and that started the national collection. And then after some time, a large amount of those plants did come back, but we're not quite sure. Um, we do have an inventory that was done right around the early 1970s. So we have a snapshot in time of what the collection does or was. So now what we're trying to do is, while we can't guarantee that any of our plants are actually original divisions off of that original uh, core uh, collection, um, we're searching for the names of the same plants um, and we're starting to incorporate those back into those collections. So we'll have some of those historical um, pieces back to our collection, which is so exciting for us. So, but when it comes to the longevity of orchids, um, I would say it's almost equivalent to like the longevity of, of iris out in your garden. As long as you keep dividing and replacing the new chunks and resetting them, that's what goes on with orchids too. So. In a, theoretically, you could have an orchid that's several hundred years old, but yet it would never be that same original clump, just like the iris. It would be the babies that would be propagated off of that endlessly. So uh, yeah, with that said, in a home, there's no reason why orchids can't live for decades. But yet what we'll talk about in Orchid 101 and repot is in order for that to happen, regular repotting, lots of regular maintenance, resetting them, um, and all that. But yeah, I, I think that answered both parts. I think it does too. Thank you. We have a couple of more questions, which as you just mentioned, Orchid 101, I know we'll cover in spade. But um, folks asking about when the best time to buy orchids is yeah. and what type of an orchid might work in a northern exposure window or whether they all need more light than that. As you mentioned, this is perfect 101 material that we will cover. Um, you can buy an orchid anytime. I mean, orchids are available year round, right? We're a global market these days. I know me, I get, um, um, you know, I mentioned, you mentioned sources. I often find myself at Ikea and they have really nice selection of orchids every now and then, um, or even Trader Joe's. I've heard Trader Joe's is a great place. The, the thing to look for and what I look for when I'm, when I get that impulse to buy is I want it to make it look like it's a fresh shipment and maybe a, a trained eye, you could tell a little bit more, but you want to look for, often you'll see phalaenopsis. That's what's generally for sale. And you want to look for when it's loaded with buds. If it's all full bloom, uh, all the flowers are open or it looks like they've been picked through well i would hold up because when they're growing in in a, a big shop or such a, you know it's it's very easy for them to be sitting in trays of water too long so you want a fresh shipment and often you, you can just you can kind of tell if it looks like they just rolled them off the truck that's the moment to buy as long as you can get it home quickly and it's not again the dead of winter where you're going to freeze your orchid or you're going to drive around the car in the summer for four hours and do other shopping and the car goes to 130 degrees because the very first thing that will happen when your orchid is upset those flower buds will turn yellow and drop and fall off and then you know what a what a you know what a bummer right so buy quickly get it home quickly don't let it get cold drafts so north window phalaenopsis i mean that's considered a low light orchid but every north window is different and we talk about this in 101 you want to have a window that at least provides a very subtle sh uh, um, shadow if in that north window there's big trees and conifers besides being on the north side of the house and it's so dark that you don't even get a shadow well that's probably not enough light. Um, and maybe that's where you just do traditional foliage uh, house plants. Um, to get a plant to bloom, it does want a little bit of light. Textbooks will often recommend an east window for even the low light orchids. So you get a tiny bit of direct sun um, and then just bright indirect light the rest of the day. So north windows are tough, but that's where artificial light comes into play. You can always add a little bit of supplemental lighting with an LED fixture and you know, lots of different tricks we can play. Exactly. And we'll cover all of that and more this Friday. I did drop a link in the chat and we'll follow up with an email to everyone who registered today 
inviting you to join us this Friday at 12.30 for ORCID 101. This virtual tour will be available on Hillwood's YouTube page to, if you want to come back and revisit. Um, and quickly, Mark Garland also very kindly shared in the chat that he is familiar with a Lancaster PA orchid shop called Little Brook Orchids. That's it. It's a fun one. It's a, it would be worth a trip. And you know, Lancaster is such a pretty little uh, town too to do the little quaint shopping and all that. So uh, yeah, nice little fun field trip from Washington. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I hope we'll see you again soon. And if you are in the DC region, please come and visit Hillwood. We are open Tuesday through Sunday, 10 through 5. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, everyone.